All right. Well, let's go ahead and get things kicked off. Um, I'm Dr. Leanne Brady, and I'm the Director of Education at the Kenke Institute. And it's my absolute pleasure um, to be with you this evening um, doing this webinar on bulk fill composites. And so as we um, kick off and we move into this conversation, the really the piece for me that I want to start out with is to tell you that if you do have questions while we go through the presentation, please feel free to um, send those to me. The way to do that is with a chat box. And so um, you'll either see a chat button in your um, controls for Zoom, or if you don't, it's underneath the word more that's got a couple of dots and you just click on that and then it'll say chat. And then you can literally chat and just send it to everybody and, um, and I will see that and I'm happy to stop for questions. So, mm -hmm. When we think about um, bulk fill composites, really the first question for me is, um, why would we use those? Because I have to tell you, being a practicing dentist for a long time, doing composites in my practice for you know several decades, um, um, the industry and dentistry as a profession had me re really, really well trained that we don't ever do bulk fill composites, that we have to layer you know, and we spent years and years and years trying to come up with different techniques for placing composites to increase the success, the longevity, um, and lots of theories. We used to learn about something called the C factor um, that led us to want to layer composites. And so, you know, what was all that about? Because really for years and years and years, it was smaller layers, smaller layers, smaller layers, and it was angled layers and, you know, all of these conversations. Well, the predominant piece of the puzzle that we were trying to overcome was the shrinkage of the composite material and the shrinkage of the composite material. And we're going to talk about that a little bit, a little bit more, um, really could create a problem. It pulls on the bonded interface. And as it pulls on the bonded interface, it can actually decrease the bonded or the adhesive attachment between the composite and the tooth. Um, we used to see these little white lines around the enamel margins, especially on class one composites. And literally the shrinkage was so significant of the composite that that was actually fracturing of the enamel rods in the cavity preparation um, that then would cause that area of the cavity to leak, get secondary decay, um, stain, margin leakage, and it would just decrease the longevity of the restoration. You know, the other piece of um, doing the layering was really depth of cure. And so, you know, traditional composites, most of the manufacturers tell us that we can cure in about one millimeter increments. Now, the manufacturers know that um, we tend to take some liberties with those rules. So typical depth of cures, if you actually look at the science, are probably more like two to two and a half millimeters of composite. Um, but certainly we can't, our traditional composites couldn't be cured in bulk. And the ability of our light curing unit to actually polymerize that material is related to lots of properties. And so um, darker colored composites, you have a lower depth of cure and you need more light input. Um, highly reflective composites like um, bleach shades um, tend to bounce the light back and they don't get the same light um, going through the material. So they have a lower depth of cure. Um, so between shrinkage and the ability to actually polymerize the material, layering became really important. And then another really important reason that we would layer is because there's really nothing more frustrating when you do a composite restoration is then to take x-rays of your patients at their next hygiene visit, six month recall. And in a bite wing, all of a sudden that composite looks like Swiss cheese and you've got all these little voids um, and you're trying to, you know, trying to figure out like, are those voids at the margin? Are they, you know, you know could they create sensitivity? You know, and the truth of it is when you see those, um, we really feel prompted to take that restoration out and do that restoration again. Um, and having the more material you have because condensing composite is really a difficult um, piece of the technique of placing composite, the more likelihood there was of having these um, porosities or voids in the fill. So layering also made sure that we avoided that and we had a nice dense fill when we thought about what that composite would look like radiographically. 
And so, you know, this concept of shrinkage of the material, you know, so, you know, today, you'll have, you know, in the previous slide, I use the terminology shrinkage thrust. And you may more um, commonly refer to that as polymerization shrinkage. Um, and so the concept of polymerization shrinkage versus shrinkage thrust is gonna be really important as we talk about bulk fill composites. And so polymerization shrinkage is actually sort of the older terminology that we use for a physical property of composite because polymerization shrinkage really refers to sort of the bulk shrinkage percentage of the material. And today we more commonly refer to the terminology using it as shrinkage stress. So what the manufacturers were able to do and the scientists looking at this is by altering the chemistry of the composite, by altering the type of filler particles, the shape of the filler particles, you know, really sort of reimagining the chemistry of composite, uh, what they were able to do is actually impact the direction of the polymerization shrinkage. And so classically, when you cure a bulk of composite, it sort of shrinks right to the center. And so if you think about that, it's pulling away from the bonded interface. And so it's putting stress on the marginal integrity or the place that the composite is up against the walls of the teeth. It's actually stressing the dentin adhesive that you put down so it can decrease the bond strength, but it can increase bond degradation. And as we said, it could even fracture enamel rods and really compromise the margin of the restoration, which we all know is the first place that a restoration um, is gonna show signs of aging and need to be um, redone. So we don't wanna add any more stress for the marginal interface than we, than we have to. Um, and so, you know, because of the concept of polymerization shrinkage, we were taught layering techniques and one millimeter layers and angled layers to reduce C factor. Um, for years, we also used um, polymerization tricks. So we talked about wave curing and ramp curing um, and using special curing lights that sort of increase the light intensity um, so that you could try to decrease the total polymerization shrinkage of that material. And so we had all of these factors and all of these concerns um, about composite materials that had really existed in dentistry for, for a very long time. And so I have to tell you, when bulk fill composites first came on the market, and they were coming on the market from manufacturers that I really respect and I trust their science, but they're, they're telling me, oh, we have this bulk fill composite. And I'm going, nope, bulk filling is bad. You all taught me not to bulk fill. We're not bulk filling. So it actually took me a while to step into the bulk fill arena. Um, and what it took for me to finally sort of um, make that leap of faith into the world of bulk fill materials was truly understanding um, the science behind bulk fill composites. And so I will have to tell you after spending a lot of time talking to different um, scientists who created these materials different from different manufacturers, from people who've done the independent science, what I've come to understand is um, bulk fill composites actually are an improvement in composite technology over the generations of composites before them. Because the scientists really had to solve a lot of these problems in order for them to be able to allow us to bulk fill. You know, and there's a lot, of, just like everything else in dentistry, um, there's always some complexity to it. And so there's things you need to understand about bulk fill composites and not all bulk fills are created equal. So we're gonna talk through that. In general terms, when a manufacturer says it's a bulk fill composite, what they now mean is you have a depth of cure of somewhere between four and six millimeters. And that pretty much covers um, everything that's out on the market today. But you need to know specifically for the manufacturer that you're uh, working with for the type of bulk fill composite, because a lot of the manufacturers actually make more than one kind of bulk fill composite. What is the specific, specific depth of cure that they recommend? Another thing that you need to know is, does the manufacturer tell you that this bulk fill composite is rated so that it can actually be what we call the cap layer or it can be the layer of composite that's on the occlusal surface of a tooth. So it's gonna take occlusal contact. 
Um, that means it has adequate wear resistance. It has adequate physical properties to be under occlusal loading. Um, or is this particular bulk fill composite, it's recommended that you actually use a different type of composite, most likely a more traditional nano category composite. So nano hybrid, nano fill, nano cluster, and you're gonna do a one to two millimeter cap layer at the very occlusal interface so that that composite that has superior physical properties that let it resist occlusal loading and occlusal wear is actually where the contacts are. Then we have um, composites that are in the bulk fill category that are condensable composites. So you're gonna need to have condensing instruments. Um, we also have materials that are more flowable um, and they have properties called self-leveling so that they actually sort of fill an axial box, a uh, plus two box or, a, or an approval preparation and they sort of level themselves from right to left. That's a property of the composite um, that it's thixotropic. So it actually gets pulled along the walls of the cavity preparation. Um, and then there's also ways to decrease the viscosity of other composites that are bulk fill. So you can get it to flow temporarily, um, but yet it's a thicker, more highly filled material. So you've got lots and lots of choices. Um, obviously there are bulk fill composites that come um, in the little plastic um, containers that go in a composite gun. Manufacturers call those compools, PLTs. They have all sorts of names for those. Um, there's bulk fill composites that come in a syringe. Um, there's bulk fill composites that come in a syringe that looks like a flowable, and you can put a flowable tip on it. Those are the less viscous materials. So you've got lots and lots of choices in the world of bulk fill materials. So let's kind of go through that and talk through some of the different, the varieties that we have. So I told you that bulk fill composites are actually an improvement in composite science. And so when we think about that, what did the manufacturers have to do? So the manufacturers actually figured out how to control the polymerization shrinkage and how to direct the polymerization, the shrinkage stress so that it's away from the bonded interface. So pretty much across the whole category of bulk fill composites, all of these materials have lower shrinkage stress numbers. They do better as far as maintaining the integrity of the interface between the composite material and the dentin adhesive and the dentin adhesive and the actual walls of the cavity preparation than the categories of material that have come before them. Um, they had to come up with a way to get increased depth of cure. And so one of the things that we do see in bulk fill composites, and this tends to be generally true across this category of materials, is that you see increased translucency. So in order to get the light to actually go deeper into the material, um, they had to make the composite itself um, less colorful, less reflective. So they increased the translucency of the material. And so one of the things that I hear about bulk fill composites, especially when they're used without a cap layer of a different kind of composite, is that they're not as aesthetic as non-bulk fill composites. So only each of us individually can answer how exact and perfect the match of a posterior composite has to be to the surrounding tooth. And then of course that varies from patient to patient. Um, and so in some patients, that's gonna be a less critical factor than others. Um, and now today, what we've actually seen is several manufacturers and Ivacor Vivident kind of um, started this trend with their Tetric EvoFlow bulk fill um, is we've seen um, bulk fill composites that are reasonably translucent because of depth of cure when they are unpolymerized. And then when they polymerize, they actually get more opaque. So the translucency decreases. And so talking to the scientists that has to do with lining up the filler particles so the light can go past when we're light curing and then polymerization actually sort of changes the direction of those filler particles so now they reflect light back and it increases the opacity or the appearance of the material. The other thing that a lot of the manufacturers have done in order to make their materials now bulk fill, and so they're going to go four to six millimeters, is they actually had to create new photo initiators. 
they had to increase the chemical efficiency of their photo initiators so that a smaller quantity of light would set off an equal amount of polymerization. And so, you know, there's been a lot of scientific advances that have gone into doing bulk fill composites. Now we do use the term bulk fill and one of the things to think about because the, you know, there's a real big kind of a conversation out there when I lecture about this, about, you know, do I wanna use a bulk fill that requires a cap layer versus a bulk fill that doesn't require a cap layer. So I don't have to use two different kinds of composites. And so I do wanna differentiate between the word bulk fill um, and single fill or single increment. So, you know, if you're using a material that is a four millimeter depth of cure, um, the only way to do a single increment is if the entire prep is less than four millimeters away from the curing light. And so, you know, when you're doing a cavity preparation, whether it be a deep class one, or as in this photograph, you've got a class two cavity preparation, um, you know, one of the things that I will do is I'll just take a periodontal probe and I'll just set it at the base of the uh, preparation so that I can actually now measure um, and I can actually see exactly how deep um, that cavity preparation is. Um, so I did see that someone um, was raising their hand. Um, and again, if you wanna ask a question, um, if you'll just type that in for me in the chat box, um, I can just read the question to everyone and then I can go ahead and answer it. So I'm absolutely happy to do that. Uh, but I do want to make sure that I'm not trying to fill more than a four to six millimeter increment, and then I'm not going to get adequate light penetration. I'm not going to get adequate polymerization. So, you know, using a cap layer for me um, really honestly isn't a big deal because of the fact that most of the time when I do a class two, I'm going to need a sec second increment of composite anyway, because my class two box is more than four millimeters deep. So I can just switch to a different composite that I do think um, has different properties. And, um, you know, in a class one preparation that's, um, you know, incipient to moderate where I don't have that much depth, then using a bulk fill composite that doesn't require a cap layer um, may be something that you prefer. But you do need to now start to think about the fact that you still can't, you still can't cure eight millimeters, 10 millimeters, 12 millimeters, so you may still have to do more than one increment. And so when we do think about a cap layer, um, you know, the cap layer only has to be one to two millimeters in thickness and actually shouldn't be more than that because of the depth of cure of these composites. And so using things like Genial Sculpt from GC America, traditional Tetric Evo Ceram from Ivoclar, Venus Diamond from Colzer, um, Filtech Supreme from 3M, lots of our traditional um, sort of nano category um, poster composites we could use. They all have a depth of cure of one to two millimeters. So that's really going to be what we're going to do so that we have um, that cap layer. Um, so we're going to use a traditional high fill composite because it has a high filler content. Um, it's going to have improved physical properties. So better wear resistance. Um, it's going to have um, long and durable aesthetics. It's going to have um, great physical properties as far as water absorption, flexural strength. So lots of reasons um, to go ahead and to use a, um, a nice cap layer. These materials have improved aesthetics, so they're not translucent like our bulk film materials. So we can actually go in and um, really improve those aesthetics and we get that better physical properties. So we did get a question to come in and the name is, what's the name of the blue matrix band from the prior slide? Um, and those um, cure through matrix bands come from Garrison. Um, so if you just go to Garrison Dental, they sell direct. Um, that's who makes those blue bands. I don't know the exact name of that product, but, they, but if you go on the Garrison website, you should be able to find those. And so I personally um, really don't mind doing a cap layer. And I, you know, there's times I decide to do a cap layer and there's times I don't do a cap layer. And again, for me, that's how fussy is the patient aesthetically? How visible is the restoration? Are we talking a lower first premolar versus an upper second molar? Um, and, you know, how much occlusal wear does this person have? So if this is a person who parafunctions, 
they have higher functional risk, um, I may want to have a, a nicer um, material as far as wear resistance on the occlusal anyway, even if I don't have to use one. So those are always a choice. So let's go through now sort of some of the variety of different um, bulk fill materials out there. And so one of the bulk fill materials that people are always curious about is a material called sonic fill from Kerr. So the sonic fill material um, I've used, um, you know, a, a quite a bit. I have the handpiece in my office. And so one of the pieces about this material is it does require a handpiece. And so you do have an up front investment in order to buy this special hand piece. And what the hand piece does is it actually delivers um, sonic vibration. Um, so it adds kinetic energy to the composite. That kinetic energy actually takes a highly filled, very viscous composite. And when you add the energy, it makes the composite flow. So it temporarily lowers the viscosity of this material. And because it lowers the viscosity, we love that handling property of just being able to inject a low viscosity material into a cavity prep. It means um, less risk of having voids and porosities, um, easier placement. You don't need a condensing instrument to really make sure you're getting this in a deeper cavity prep, but you still have the physical properties of the high filler content. And then the material after it's expressed out of the handpiece and the kinetic energy dissipates, comes back to its normal viscosity. Um, because of the filler content of this material, they say it does not require a cap layer. Um, it does have a six millimeter depth of cure. And part of the reason it has a, it got a six millimeter depth of cure is the material is very translucent. So my experience is um, it's not a very aesthetic material. Um, so what you're gonna compromise for that six millimeter depth of cure is the aesthetic appearance because it's highly translucent. Um, and again, you have to have the handpiece um, in order to place the composite. Probably what I think is probably the more popular versions of bulk fill composites is um, injectable or flowable bulk fill composites. Um, and so this was actually the original bulk fill that came from, to the, on the market, um, was sort of the FDR version of this. And most of the manufacturers have a bulk fill flowable composite. In order for materials to flow, they have to have a lower filler content. The higher the filler content, the greater the viscosity of the material. So it's pretty easy to tell the filler percentage of a composite material just by its viscosity. It's sort of just a uh, sort of an off the cuff way to look at the filler content. And why do we care about the filler content? We actually care about filler percentage because the higher the filler percentage, the better the physical properties of the material. And you know, so composite science over its entire iteration has been trying to figure out the balance of increasing filler percentage without the viscosity of the material making it unmanageable. So we wanna improve the physical properties, but we don't want to destroy the handling properties. And so it's been this really fine balance you know, most of us prefer um, using lower viscosity materials, especially for lots of different applications. And, but yet when we do that, um, we compromise physical properties. So it's this, it's this balancing act. So all of the flowable versions of the um, bulk fill materials um, actually require a cap layer um, because of the different physical properties. So they don't have adequate occlusal wear. They're not gonna be able to resist occlusal loading and handling as well because of the lower filler properties. Now I will tell you with an exception, the genial bulk bag, we call theirs an injectable versus a uh, flowable to sort of try to differentiate it. So it does have a higher filler percentage um, than the ones that call themselves flowable. And there are very specific clinical applications with that material where you can use it all the way to the surface of the cavity preparation. Um, so that's kind of a unique material in this category. So we preferentially love these because they're lower viscosity, easier to place. The easier they are to place when you don't need a condenser, you minimize or reduce completely having voids that you would pick up on a radiograph. Um, a lot of these materials are highly thixotropic, 
on what we say is their self leveling. So you also don't need to move the tip around because that introduces voids. Um, and pretty much across the board, all of these have a four millimeter depth of cure. Um, one of the pieces of these materials is radial opacity. So we each probably have a clinical preference as to the radial opacity of these materials. Um, and what we actually like to use so that um, we our, our composites look the way we like them on a radiograph. So I actually like really radio opaque materials. Um, I like to easily be able to differentiate the composite from the dentin, from the enamel, or possibly from the K. Um, and so I'm, I'm personally pretty picky about that. Um, I will tell you that um, all three of the materials that are on, this, on the slide I've used in my practice, um, I classically am using the Tetric um, EvoFlow bulk fill um, for my class two boxes um, because it has a really high radio opacity. Um, it is got really nice self-leveling properties. And um, again, that's the material I told you that's translucent before it's polymerized and then becomes more opaque after you polymerize it. Um, and I've actually been using the Genial Bulk the Injectable um, to do some small class ones and um, some class fives. It's a really aesthetic material. It's a really, really nice material for that. Okay? Um, and so lots of different applications where I use these. I will tell you because they all come out of a syringe with a flowable tip and you're gonna inject them into a cavity preparation. Uh, what I like to do is I like to inject the material um, sort of in a central position in a class two box. Um, and I like to actually try to move the tip of the syringe as little as possible. And I really don't wanna pull the tip up and put it back in. When you do that, you get a phenomenon called suck back and you introduce a porosity. And so I'll inject that material. I watch as I inject that the material is spreading to the buccal lingual axial walls up against the matrix fan. And then I'm very slowly lifting the tip of the flowable syringe for the occlusal as the box is filling or as the occlusal preparation is filling. Um, so there is a little bit of a technique piece with these of making sure that you don't get voids. I don't play with it with an explorer or a condenser. Again, you get suck back, you introduce porosities, but I will wait a solid 10 seconds before I polymerize and give it time to do that self-leveling effect. And then I'm gonna go ahead and hit this with a light curing unit. And then we have um, our bulk fill composites that are like more traditional composites. So they have the viscosity of a more traditional composite. And so there's lots of these on the market. Um, you know, DMG America just brought their echo site out on the market. Um, probably in the last year, year and a half. And one of the things that's really cool about it is they have a really cool color schema and they have the blue and they have other colors that help with opacity issues. Um, you know, 3M makes a flowable version of their Tetric bulk fill plus a condensable version. Um, Tetric makes their um, Evo flow from Ivoclar and they also make a condensable version. So lots, as I said, lots of the manufacturers have their bulk fill composites in multiple different types of um, handling properties so that you can find something that meets your requirements, that's gonna give you something that you like to work with. So these materials are um, higher viscosity. The thing we know about them because they're higher viscosity and they require, require condensation is they have a higher filler content. As Soon as you go to a high enough filler content that the material doesn't flow on its own, um, then you know you have really good physical properties that are gonna mean you don't need a cap layer. These materials can withstand um, approval loading. They have really good wear resistance. Um, but now you do have the challenge of placing these materials and um, condensing them. And condensation is really not a good term when we think about composite materials uh, because we really shouldn't condense them, we should place them. We use the term condensing because we used to condense amalgam and we use the same instrument uh, again, you don't want the tip of the instrument to go more than a millimeter into the material because when you lift it, you get sucked back. And these materials all pretty consistently have a four millimeter depth of cure. So one of the things to introduce when we talk about these higher filler percentage materials, condensable composites, 
And by the way, this applies to bulk fill and to traditional non-bulk fill composites, is the idea of warming composites. So I told you earlier that if you add kinetic energy to composite, um, as the molecules start to vibrate, the material flows, even though it has a really high filler percentage. And the same thing is true when you add thermal energy to composite. And so when we warm composite, um, we increase the flowability, we lower the viscosity of the material, and we do it temporarily. Um, so quick, quick uh, question that came up is when I test a curing light, what number should I look for? And how often do I need to test curing lights? Um, those are actually great questions. Um, there's actually no specific number. Um, you should actually know what the light output is of the light that you bought. Um, so you should know what the manufacturer is telling you that you're gonna get. Um, pretty common LED curing lights um, that tell you typically of a 10 or a 20 second light cure um, is going to be somewhere in a, around 1,000, but you know, 850, 870 to 1,100, you're going to have a range, but it's probably going to be around 1,000. Um, light curing is actually just a math equation. It's the light energy of your light or the light output times the time of exposure, and that gives you the total light energy. And the manufacturers know the total light energy to get to a polymerization threshold for their material. So light curing units that tell you they have five second cure um, are putting out twice the light energy of a 10 second cure. If they have a three second cure, they're putting out like three times the light energy of a 10 second cure, but you gotta get to that total amount. How often should you test your cure and light? I recommend highly that you test your cure and light once every 30 days. Um, have your auxiliaries create a log where they can keep those numbers by yourself, a light curing testing unit. They're $250 um, and keep a log. The thing that's much more important than the light output of your unit is the trend. And if you start to see your light curing units um, light output decreasing month to month, then either the battery is failing, the electronics is failing, it's not getting a full charge depending on how old the light curing unit is, or potentially the light guide is being obstructed either because you're getting composite on the end, you're getting dent adhesive on the end, you are and your auxiliaries are cleaning them and scratching the end and the light is reflecting. Um, but if the light energy is going down month over month, you need to probably send that curing light back to the manufacturer and then you're going to need to have it serviced or buy a new light guide. So we like to test ours about once a month and we just wanna see consistency. So great question. So let's go back to the idea of composite warmers. And what we were talking about is that the addition of thermal energy to composite um, actually causes these materials to flow. Um, and so this, these happen to be pictures of a CalSec composite warmer from ADENT is the name of the company, A-D-E-N-T. Um, and these are the composite warmers that I have in my office. Um, they're not a very expensive piece of equipment. You keep them in an operatory, you plug them in, they're kind of like coffee warmers. They stay at a consistent temperature um, all day long. Um, you can choose the black base is the part that um, creates the heat. And then the silver pieces on top, they have about four different varieties. And you can pick um, what kind of um, a silver piece you want. So you can just heat up the little PLTs or compules um, I actually have the one in the center um, because I actually will have one in my composite gun ready to go. And we literally just put it down in the warmer. Um, you can also buy them that keep syringes if you like syringes of material better. Um, you can put the tips of instruments so that the instruments get warm. Um, and once you start using a composite warmer, you will never go back. It's like everything you buy in your office, you actually have to buy it, take it out of the box, plug it in, and then you sort of have to force yourself to use it the first time or two. But once you start to use a composite warmer, you're gonna get addicted because every single composite has these awesome physical properties and they flow and they go right where you want it, whether you're using it for anterior or posterior. And just like with the sonic energy, it makes the handling properties 20 times better. But as soon as the composite cools, 
the density returns um, and you actually have get to take advantage of the great physical properties of a higher fill composite and the great handling properties of a composite that flows. So let me just stop um, and add, um, uh, ask, a, have another question. Um, and we'll come back to this as an adhesion, a bonding question. So we'll come back to this in just one second. Um, so let's just finish the conversation about composite warmers. So I did say that it increases the flowability temporarily um, so that um, while the temperature is there, um, it actually, believe it or not, also decreases the required cure time. So it actually increases the ability of the composite to polymerize. Um, it actually increases the depth of cure. So you actually get greater light penetration when the composite is warm. Um, because the material is flowing and you don't have to condense, it just goes where you want it, you reduce voids and marginal micro leakage. You actually get better um, adaptation to the margins. And it also reduces the shrinkage stress. Um, so not only does a composite warmer improve your ability to work with the material, it's gonna make it so much easier to fill a class two, deep class one. I actually use it for my anteriors as well. Um, but it actually in, decreases some of the technique sensitivity of composite and increases some of the, the phenomenons that go to longevity of a composite. And so if you've not played with a composite warmer, uh, I highly recommend they're worth trying. Um, and by the way, um, another thing I will just, I'll just mention is the, com the composite gun in this photograph um, is probably the best composite gun um, on the market. So it's actually a metal, it's not a plastic composite gun, it's a metal composite gun. Um, and there's two places you can get these. They are sold by Avent with their Calcet warmer and Culzer sells this um, composite gun. And I will tell you the first time I used them was in a hands-on workshop I was teaching um, and um, we had them. Um, and I was like, oh my God, this is the best composite gun I've ever used. And um, you know, it's silly to probably say you can fall in love with a composite gun, but I love those composite guns. And they, to me, I would never go back to using the plastic ones. Um, these are, they're worth having and they're not super expensive. Um, so the question that came up was about adhesives. And so I do want to just go back and sort of answer that question before we um, wrap up our time together. So the question was about micro leakage and adhesives and specifically about universal adhesives. And so I will tell you, just like with bulk fill composites, mm -hmm. universal dent adhesives are an actual leap forward in the scientific technology behind dentin adhesives. And so when we use the word universal, um, pretty much across manufacturers, what we mean is you can choose the etching technique. So you can self-etch, meaning no blue gel of any kind, no phosphoric acid. You can total etch, which means you're gonna put phosphoric acid on the enamel and the dentin simultaneously, rinse, dry, and then go to your um, adhesive process. Um, you can also either hybrid etch, which means you put phosphoric acid on the enamel only for 10 seconds, rinse and dry, and then use this to finish etching the enamel and etch the dentin. Um, so you can use any etching technique and a universal adhesive will work because the pH has been perfectly balanced to get enough etching without over etching the dentin in all of those different techniques, okay? Um, you, you know, some of the universal adhesives um, come with a dual cure activator. So if you wanna turn them into a dual cure adhesive, you could do that. Um, but pretty much across the board, the universal adhesives, um, once they are light cured, um, will not impair or impede the polymerization of dual cure materials because their pH is such that it doesn't get rid of chemical polymerization. Um, so there are some unique differences across the manufacturers that you need to know about. But um, really what happened, the reason we went to universal adhesives, believe it or not, was because um, Curare Corporation held a patent on um, something called MDP. And when their patent expired, um, it allowed the other manufacturers to use that chemistry in their dentin adhesives. Um, and MDP is what allows us to use the word universal. So MDP is the perfect pH 
so that you can total etch, self etch, hybrid etch, select the etch, and it doesn't have any negative implications. Um, MDP actually works against enamel, dentin, composite, um, traditional ceramic, lithium disilicate, zirconia, and metal. Um, you know, MDP um, is what allows that sort of nice pH that means that they don't interfere with dual cure. So it was really the addition of that chemistry and that MDP chemistry is better chemistry than prior generations. So um, when universal dent adhesives came out and I understood the chemistry behind them, I did switch um, to a universal dent adhesive. Um, and I actually used two universal dent adhesives in my pri private practice. Um, and so I actually use Ibon Universal from Culture for my direct restorations when I do composites. And I use Adhes Universal from Ibacar Vivident when I'm seeding indirect restorations because I, my, when I'm using an Ibacar Vivident um, cement, like Verilink Aesthetic Light Cured or Verilink Aesthetic Dual Cured, I want to use their universal adhesive with it. So I will use that Adhes Universal with that. I do believe in sticking with a manufacturer when you're in the world of indirect restorations, which of course is, we were talking about direct restorations. So, um, but across the board, if you're using a universal adhesive, I think that's better chemistry than the prior generations. And um, by the way, less, less worries with inventory control because you can buy one adhesive and not have to worry about it. Less problems with your assistant knowing what to put out um, so there's some other advantages as well. Just make sure you know the manufacturer directions for whatever you're using. Good news is all of those, what we call IFUs, instructions for use, or DFUs, directions for use, are on the internet. So you can just Google them and um, you can um, really yeah, easily find those instructions. And a lot of the times they actually print those on a pictograph, like a little laminated card. So you can have those as well. So um, yeah, so I would definitely endorse using a universal adhesive. Now, if you are having challenges with micro leakage, which was kind of the crux of the question, um, before you switch adhesives, one of the things I would tell you is, um, you know, micro leakage, recurrent decay is probably the primary thing that causes us to replace a uh, direct composite. And there's lots of pieces. If you're thinking that's happening prematurely, the composite hasn't gotten um, longevity in the mouth that you feel comfortable with, um, then there's a lot of things to look at. And it could be your preparation design and how you're doing the margins. Um, it could be how you're finishing the composite. Like one of my all-time favorite things is to finish composites with a brownie point, a brown silicone point running at slow speed you get this great infinity margin and it doesn't trap the stain and bacteria. Um, you also need to look at um, your adhesive protocol. So you want to make sure that you're etching enamel long enough and that you're not over etching. Um, you do need to understand your adhesive. If you're, you know, uh, using an adhesive that requires refrigeration, should be refrigerated. If you're using an adhesive that says shake vigorously before you use, got to shake it vigorously or you're not getting all of the chemistry. A huge challenge with dentin adhesives is that they're liquefied with a solvent and that's either acetone or ethanol. The solvent evaporates very rapidly, so three to seven seconds. Dentin adhesives should not be dispensed and be out in the air um, more than three to seven seconds before you take that micro brush to the tooth. And so I only use that little white plastic thing with the wells so that I can put the tip of the micro brush over it and then we can get our adhesive on it or my assistant will literally put the adhesive out and then I dunk it as we're gonna use it. Um, so if your assistant is trying to be time efficient and putting your adhesive out ahead of time and then covering it with a little orange plastic shield that keeps it from light curing but it doesn't keep the solvent from evaporating. And when the solvent evaporates, the viscosity increases and you're not gonna actually get good hybrid zone development, good penetration into etched enamel. So you have an inferior bonded interface. And that's probably a huge piece of what we have challenges with. Um, it's also one of the reasons I'm not a super big fan of unidose adhesive delivery systems 
because there's a lot of adhesive in there and we always feel obligated when we pop the top to use it for multiple teeth. But once you pop the top, it's evaporating. So um, I really like um, bottles where I can do a single drop or Ivacar's um, Viva Pen system, ways that we can control evaporation. Um, so there could be a number of things that are going into that. Again, um, depth of cure. If you're using a traditional composite or a bulk fill and you are doing a greater depth of cure than the manufacturer recommends, you could have increased shrinkage stress that's putting stress on the bonded interface that's causing those margins to break down prematurely. So lots of possible things to look at in your composite technique if you are seeing premature leakage around the margins. And then of course, one of the things that we always have to be concerned about is isolation. Our newer materials, universal adhesives, um, are much more moisture tolerant than prior generations, but all um, adhesives is best done in an isolated dry field. Um, and if you do have contamination, it'll decrease the lifespan of your composites. So um, ideally, um, inverted, well-placed rubber dam. I know as soon as I say that, people cringe um, because there's so many hassles of placing a rubber dam. Um, but isolite, um, if you work with an isolite, is great. Um, an isolation device from Colger called Relief, R-E-L-E-A-F. It's great for patients who can't tolerate an isolite or have TMD issues and we shouldn't put them on a bite block. Um, Optrogate from Ivacor Vividen um, to retract in the anterior if you're doing class three, class four composites. So some sort of retraction device, try to increase the um, ability to isolate the field and keep it free from saliva and moisture. That'll increase the longevity of your restorations. So um, lots of options from that perspective. So we are getting sort of to the end of our time together, but also um, want to just invite if there's more questions that you go ahead and put those in the chat box um, and we will go ahead and we'll get those answered. Um, so next question is, can I recommend a great composite polishing kit? Um, you know, there's actually lots of these on the market. Um, people really love to use um, pogo polishers. Um, they make the Venus super polishers. There's lots of different polishers around. I will tell you personally for me, I use a, a polishing sequence for my composites. I use Brassler's Featherlight um, composite polishers. They have a latch and they go on a slow speed hand piece. You run them at, with your hand piece on the slow, slow speed setting set about, you know, between seven and 12 to 13. If you run them too fast, they fall apart and they really should be multi-use. They also make new ones called the Brio polishers that um, are sort of multi-purpose and um, people are loving those. But I use the traditional feather lights for composite. There's two colors, sort of a lightish mintish green and then sort of a gray. And then probably for me, no matter what silicone based polishing system that you use, the very best um, way to finish polishing is with diamond polishing paste. So my last step is always a bristle brush. You can use a Profi cup um, in a latch cam piece. I use ultra dense fine micron diamond polishing paste um, and you will get really beautiful surface texture. They feel smooth. Your patients will love them um, and they look really gorgeous. So if you've not played with diamond polishing paste might be worth trying. So as we wrap up, um, I did wanna just um, invite everyone um, to come and visit us at the Panky Institute. Um, we are located on a little island called Key Biscayne. We're about 20 minutes from Miami International Airport, so we're not actually down in the Keys, although we are on an unbelievable barrier island with beautiful ocean, um, and it's a great destination location. It's super convenient to Miami International. Um, our main curriculum is called The Essentials, um, and that journey starts with E1. And I've gone ahead and I've put up a link here and you'll actually get that in a follow-up email as well um, to a web page where you can go get more information about E1 um, and um, coming down and joining us for that. Um, we also um, have uh, four two-day lecture courses, which are a great way um, to come and just sort of try out Panky. They're Friday, Saturday and shorter days. Um, and so um, you get to kind of just see the facility and experience Panky. 
um, before you dive into the essentials, along with a whole host of um, topic-specific classes. So sleep and TMD, um, we have a great hygiene program, we have a, a business of dentistry class that we run every year, um, so an aesthetics program. So um, you can check all of that out at either um, pankygram.org is a great blog site for the Institute, lots and lots of free content from all of our faculty, and also has great course listings, or you can go to our main website, which is panky.org. So we have one more question that looks like it um, popped up here. Oh, and yes, um, thank you, Judy, for reminding me um, about our women's retreat. We do have a great women's retreat um, that happens every year. So um, definitely check out our classes on either one of our websites. Um, I am absolutely happy if you have any further questions um, to, um, to answer those. My email is lbrady at panky.org. Um, and so um, drop me an email if there's a question you didn't get in tonight. And um, for those of you who are on the webinar, we actually are recording the webinar and um, we will send you a follow up email. We'll have a link to the, um, to the landing page that's listed here and a link to the recording. If you wanna go back and watch it again or potentially have your auxiliaries watch it. Um, so I'm going to say thank you to everybody for joining us this evening. Um, oh, we got one more question that's getting in here under the wire. Let's see what just came in. Um, yes, I can repeat my email. That's an easy question. It's L Brady B R A D Y at Panky P A N K E Y dot O R G. With that, I'll say good night, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your evening, and thanks for joining us.